Thank you very much. It's an honor to be included in this event. I have studied corruption for two decades and written extensively on it. That's the um, most recent writing, which is written for a general audience. In my seven minutes, I will make three points, but let me preface my remark, my remarks by uh, reminding you what corruption is. It's the use or abuse of public office for personal or partisan gain. How do I Okay. So my first point is that corruption is a culture. A culture is something that is sustained by mutual expectations. Bribe payers and bribe takers expect to be operating in a corrupt environment. A great illustration of this comes from research conducted with truckers on the highways of West Africa. I didn't do that research because this is one research project that would have been impossible for a female researcher to undertake. Uh, in this setting, truckers have to pay a bribe every time they encounter a checkpoint on the highway, and there are hundreds and hundreds of checkpoints. The researcher who rode with the truckers, that's why it had to be a guy, to study these interactions found that the average time to get through the checkpoints was about five seconds. This means that the truckers knew that they had to pay a bribe, they had their bribe money set aside, and they knew how much to pay. Uh, if this weren't the case, they couldn't have breezed through those checkpoints. So if you want to eradicate that form of corruption, asking truckers simply not to pay would not have worked. Asking a single trucker not to pay would have been even worse because that poor guy would simply have been stuck at the first checkpoint for the rest of his life. So stopping these corrupt interactions means that the men taking the bribes have to stop expecting to receive them. This is what is called a big bang approach. That is, you have to get large numbers of participants on both sides of the interaction to stop the exchange simultaneously. This is an implication of thinking about corruption as a culture, that to stop corruption, you have to change expectations and you have to do so using a big bang approach. My second point follows directly from my first. Obviously, the men manning those checkpoints are not going to want to stop taking bribes. They are benefiting from the extra income that they receive. The bribes are supplementing their salaries. So let's assume through a combination of carrots and sticks that you devise new policies that actually tries to prevent these men at the checkpoints from extorting truck drivers. Let's say you raise their salaries to try to compensate for the lost bribes and you install webcams at the checkpoints to monitor that they don't continue to take bribes. Even so, the people who are on the losing end are going to strategically reorient their behavior. If they can no longer take bribes when the, bri when the webcams are operating, they're going to look for alternatives. Perhaps they'll sabotage the webcams and continue to demand bribes from the truck drivers. Or perhaps, and this is very likely, the webcams will fail when the electricity goes out, and then the guards will be able to take bribes knowing that no one can observe their behavior. So these kinds of ev evasive actions are extremely common and they're called spillovers. Do spillovers mean that policies to reduce corruption are hopeless? Will people who stand to lose out when anti-corruption policies come into effect simply make up their losses in other ways, maybe even in ways that are more difficult to discover? 
Research shows that when corrupt officials have to reorient their behavior in response to anti-corruption policies, the overall aggregate impact is a reduction in corruption. This makes sense because the evasive action will result in less corruption. If that hadn't been the case, they would have been using that action in the first place. Think of it historically. Think of over long stretches of time. In countries that used to be very corrupt, including the United States, anti-corruption policies have gradually been effective despite the opportunities for strategic displacement. But spillovers need to be anticipated when designing anti-corruption policies in order to make those policies as effective as possible and reduce the spillovers. My final point has to do with identifying the opportunities for anti-corruption policies to be most effective. This figure shows the relationship between GDP per capita on the x-axis at the bottom and Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index. So you can see that GDP per capita is very closely related to, to corruption and that corruption falls as GDP per capita rises. If we were to draw a line that statistically predicts corruption on the basis of GDP, this is what it would look like. In this figure, countries that are above the line have more corruption than GDP alone predicts. These are countries which have experienced substantial economic development, but where corruption hasn't fallen as much as expected. Perhaps it's even gotten worse. Those are the countries with the most pent up demand for corruption and whose political leaders have the most opportunities to reduce corruption. For instance, in Latin America, with some of whose countries are highlighted in red, you can see that Mexico, Guatemala, and Colombia are all above the line, and Costa Rica, by contrast, is below the line. So don't waste anti-corruption initiatives on Costa Rica. They're already doing extremely well, given how wealthy they are. On the countries above the line, Mexico is the furthest off the line of those I've highlighted. And it is generally believed to have the most corruption relative to its level of economic development. In fact, in Mexico, there's huge popular appetite for anti-corruption initiatives as reflected in the most recent election results. Anti-corruption activists should therefore take advantage of this by keeping Mexico in the global spotlight, providing resources to policymakers there, and encouraging public surveillance of, uh, of anti-corruption initiatives in the country. As part of these efforts, it is especially important to watch for and guard against strategic reorientation by corrupt officials who will seek to evade the new anti-corruption efforts precisely in order to preserve the illegal incomes that they have been making from corruption. So you can see my work is mainly at the micro level, not the big macro level. I hope that it's informative for those of you who think uh, at the systems level and that these remarks have been helpful. Uh, I'd like to actually tell you a story about one of my students. And it, um, so one of my students was a captain in the Indian Army. His name was Vivek Gurg. And he had served in some of the most difficult anti-insurgency operations that India has to offer, and India has to offer many, as you, as you know. And he had been in Kashmir, he'd been in the northeast of the country, he'd been on the Siachen Glacier. Um, one day, um, you know, he was, he was a captain, so he was commanding a company. His platoon was in sort of anti-insurgency operations in Kashmir. And a phone, a, a, a villager called a phone, a mobile phone number, it led to uh, the explosion of an IED which killed three members of Vivek's platoon. 
when Vivek asked the villager, why did you call this number? He, the, the villager said, well, you know, I didn't expect it to trigger an explosion. I thought this was going to call the insurgents and they were going to take care of whatever they were going to do. So you know, to Vivek, that was kind of beside the point. He kind of realized that the Indian Army's approach to anti-insurgency operations, which was largely projection of force and showing you know, the flag and so on and so forth, was not working. So he resigned from his commission from the Indian Army and he set up an NGO called Business Alternatives for Peace and Reconciliation. Now, the initial approach that he had was very common in, in development economics, and I'm sure many of you have sort of gone, you know, seen similar things, initiatives in conflict zones. He thought, well, by building up opportunity costs, building up um, you know, economic opportunities in this area, maybe we can you know, make, shift people away from conflict towards peace. And so, you know, one common way we do this in development is we use microfinance, and particularly for women. And so he set up a microfinance um, institution but what he found was like, you know, things were going reasonably well, but then very soon the, you know, the insurgents and others basically, you know, began taxing the, 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 the local communities. And in fact, you know, as, as many of you know, India has actually banned microfinance NGOs in many of these conflict zones because it's seen as fueling the conflict in many ways by creating a resource which are being tapped by, by kind of extreme groups in, 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 in many places. So, so this kind of this problem where you know, resources, when you try to build up local development, it's often easy to just steal it and fuel conflict further is, some, is a generic problem that you know, we face time and again in, in conflicts throughout the world. Vivek did something a bit different, and this is kind of ties to my own research, which is why I was particularly excited by it. But uh, what he did was he then pivoted again. So in the northeast of India, there's an there's a, um, area called Manipur, which has a lot of ethnic divisions. The main city is Imphal. It's, uh, it's, um, it's only accessed by a major, one major highway. And this kind of highway was, could be blockaded, and it was regularly blockaded by a separatist group that wanted kind of free you know, independence for, for their community. Now, what Vivek did is, he, again, he approached um, one, one kind of unique thing about this place, but I don't think it's that unique, is that all of these communities have their own traditional um, shawls and artisanal handlooms. What Vivek did was he was able to contact the women from the kind of the blockading community, said, well, look, we're going to give you a, a, a contract for your shawls. It's going to be too big for you to be able to complete on your own. And we want also the shawls of the community in the city, which you're blockading. And so he actually facilitated the interaction between the women of the two communities. They built their, they, they built their own organization. And later on, um, and, and when the blockade happened, you know, they, they, the, the, the men, who are mostly the ones who are doing the blockading, actually allowed the women to continue to kind of trade with one another and, and fulfill these contracts. Later on, when the downstream community also got a contract, they brought in the, the people who were kind of on the road as well. And so this kind of uh, gradually began to undermine this blockade which was happening in Manipur. <laughs> now, I think some of the kind of broader ideas here are that they, they he induced what you might know called complementarity between the groups. There was gains to, for them to work together. He facilitated the interaction between them so they had an organization that they could later build on in a way that it was also hard. Once we, organizations are hard to steal, obviously. Right? So unlike the money issue that often came, came about, by, able, by creating organizations and complementarity and kind of a shared future, he was able to uh, mitigate some of these incentives for conflict. More generally, you, know, you can think about how can this scale? Well, you can build these small organizations, that's one way. Another way is using financial incentives. So one thing that we've done is we've randomly signed, um, for, well, one, one experiment we did in Israel is we randomly signed likely Jewish voters to, to basically hold stock in both their own economy as well as in the Palestinian economy. Separately, we're tracking, we allowed them to trade and learn about the stock market. Many of you have never traded in stocks before. Um, we found that, you know, separately when we kind of, uh, Track, we were tra separately tracking their political attitudes and attitudes towards the peace process. We found that just being exposed to you know, $50 worth or $100 worth of stock was enough to change people's attitudes in, in an important way towards the peace process. They were less likely to oppose very kind of visceral concessions which one might make in order for peace. They changed their voting decisions in, in, in favor of parties which are more favorable to restarting the peace negotiations. And they changed their evaluation of the gains from peace to Israel's economy. Oftentimes we think about, you know, oftentimes in our day-to-day -day interactions, we don't think about how conflict 
you know, we think about conflict in terms of the visceral nature of it rather than the effects on economics and broader policies. But we know that, you know, in the US, for example, people vote often based on sociotropic ideas. They vote, they vote based on the kind of situation for those around them and whether they're economically doing better or worse. We found that by just making, we, giving people some, a little bit of stock, they were, and giving them incentives to trade it regularly, they became more financially literate, women in particular, and they changed their attitudes toward the peace process in a very robust way, which lasted it a year after the intervention. So we did this with, uh, before the Brexit referendum. We also found that exposing people to um, incentives to um, in shares in companies which were complementary between the Euro European Union and the UK had similar effects on voting for Remain. We think this is a durable way of learning for people. It's empowering for them. And it also pushes the incentives in such a way that it's hard to steal, uh, which is kind of this recurrent problem when you're trying to enhance development in a conflict zone. So I've, I think I'm way past my seven minutes, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Mark Nelson. I co-direct the Peace Innovation Lab here at Stanford with my colleague Margarita, who is standing in the back of the room. Okay, not where she was sitting a moment ago. Um, I want to very quickly provide you, I hope, a new lens on what you are doing and uh, a hint at some new tools that are coming to help you do what you're doing. So um, very quickly, if you are interested in increasing peace in the world, if you're in the room for that reason today, another way to think about what you are doing is this emerging field of peace engineering. And I'm, I'm setting that up as a little bit of prelude for those of you who aren't interested or, or who aren't aware. Um, all the deans of all the engineering schools in the world are getting together next week in New Mexico to have the first international peace engineering conference because they have recognized that peace engineering needs to be a thing and they need to figure out how to teach, uh, how to teach people how to do this. So um, with that as an overview and foreshadowing, let me just say um, engineering normally proceeds in four stages. First of all, you have to be able to observe the phenomena you care about. And this is one reason we have been so uh, grateful for the work of IEP and, and the Global Peace Index is it has uh, begun to not only uh, surface and make visible phenomena that people weren't aware of at the macro level, but it also began to measure them, which is the second stage of any engineering discipline. You have to be able to measure that phenomena that you can now observe and distinguish from the background noise. Um, if you can then measure the phenomena, that enables you to start instrumenting your environment to, to, uh, uh, pay to automatically extract relevant data from the, from the environment, which then in turn allows you to start designing interventions that you can really validate your intervention is effective, okay? And right now, uh, we're not at that stage yet, but we're getting so much closer. So um, I, I want to do a quick overview here before my timer goes off, um, <clears throat> to uh, uh, contextualize our work. Um, if you think about what the Global Peace Index has done, uh, and, and Steve and his team at, at the Institute for Economics and Peace, if you think of them by analogy as studying the macro phenomena, the data that were available at the time they started in 2007, uh, UN data, international government data, national government data, and so forth, um, these are all sort of the macro phenomena of peace. And, and so by analogy, if we think physics here for a moment, um, IEP are, are the astrophysicists of peace. And we started uh, a year later uh, with encouragement from Steve, uh, 2008, looking at what are the micro phenomena? What are the tiniest things? Because we were given a great gift by technology, which leapt forward to the third stage of instrumenting, and that was these things. We have more than 2.5 billion people this year with one of these in their pocket. And these things can measure passively, in the background, human behavior, and specifically human social behavior. And so we get this real-time flow of micro-behavioral data that was never possible before. What that means is we need a data standard to make sense of this. And so a large part of our work over the last few years has been developing what is now officially, uh, was announced in March of this year, the Hague Peace Data Standard, which is uh, going to be, um, uh, they have the idea that it should be the same as the Hague Convention, basically. This enables any organization that is using technology in their daily operations 
to take the data that right now is a byproduct of those daily operations and turn it into systematic structured piece data that enables comparative analysis that has never been possible before. So we think that's incredibly exciting. Um, many other people think it's incredibly boring. It's the equivalent of inventing the ruler or the inch or something. But, um, but that enabled, when you, when you look back historically, um, in the 1700s when we standardized what an inch was or what a centimeter was or what a kilogram was, those enabled huge advances over the next two centuries in uh, the production and distribution of wealth around the world. If you look at the historical lines uh, for most of human history, we averaged about $400 per year in today's dollars of, of income per person. And it was only after we standardized those measurements that suddenly we were able to do this in terms of global income around the world. So we think that building these kinds of tools for practitioners has the potential to, uh, to really enable so, some interesting new developments for all of you in the field. Um, so, so, by contrast to the astrophysicists of IEP, of PEACE, uh, you should think of us as the, as the particle physicists in our lab. We're really concerned about what are the tiniest behaviors that make a difference, and how can we measure them, and how can we measure them in real time and aggregate that. So, um, <clears throat> what that means is that because we were given this jump ahead gift of instrumentation, um, we can now begin to systematically partner with organizations all around the world who have this kind of data, for whom the data, by the way, is a liability unless they can turn it into value. Um, and, uh, and that means we have this unique uh, bit of a chance to look at some preliminary results. And I'll, I'll just, uh, wrap up with these. Um, the Institute for Economics and Peace, uh, since their founding, did a lovely job of debunking the horrible myth that one of the reasons we have war is that war is good for business. And uh, Steve and his team really thoroughly showed that war is bad for business, unless you're Halliburton or Blackwater. But otherwise, war is bad for business. Okay, so. Um, that was a huge improvement, and we can now see in the beginning of the data that we can extract that we can go a couple steps further. It's not only that peace is good for business. Preliminary results show that business is good for peace. Business is really good for peace, and I'll give you one little clue why. Business is the only domain where we have found where two people who are different from each other, by doing some mutual mutually beneficial interaction because of their difference can create and redistribute new wealth. It's the only way our species has ever found to do that. I'll wrap up with that. Thank you very much for your interest. You know, thank you, Mark. You actually segued really nicely into uh, a couple comments I wanted to, to make about business being good for peace. I, I just wanted to frame the, the next seven minutes in in, in a way of looking at markets and looking at businesses and companies. So on the market side, um, what Mark is saying is that uh, the, the business conditions that exist are important for important placeholders and catalysts for peace. And to give you an example, um, I worked in Sudan several years ago and during the, the, the war and the peace, uh, comprehensive peace agreement, there was an area called Abie, um, which was a vital place of, with a lot of oil um, for both the north and the south. However, that place was also a vital crossing point between the Miseria, which are nomadic herders, and, and Dinka, who were farmers. Um, they were at warring as well. But what really worked and what we helped support was peace markets in the areas where they could trade. And because of the influence of traders on the economy, again, these are leaders in the community, um, the, they were also making, extending out their personal relationships around a, a common good around the markets and the necessity to have one product from one side, one service from another side to extend into the politics of decision making at a local level. And, um, you know, actually some of the work that Sumitra has done on Hindu and, and Muslim fishermen uh, addresses this issue as well in, in India about uh, different ethnic groups with uh, a macro level 
uh, identity issues, but when they come across commonalities of trade and business, um, it opens up the relationships and creates the foundation for peace building. Um, a couple words on the private sector. You know, in the areas where Mercy Corps works around the world, we, we are steeped in the geographic and political and socio-spaces of, of conflict. And in historically, much of the conflict that we have seen has been rooted in relationships between citizen and state or citizen and private sector, and many times the private sector as an extension of state, especially in extractive industries. Um, and for example, then, in, in Colombia where we work, and I, I hate to <laughs> beat be a horse uh, around Colombia again this morning, but it provides a good example of where Mercy Corps has worked with an extractive uh, company, an oil company in southern Colombia that traditionally has looked at using corporate social responsibility to extend its um, its, its security apparatus. So they know that they're always under the limelight from local communities because of their extractive practices. They know that they're antagonizing at previously the FARC or the ELN. Um, and so they pulled together a corporate social responsibility work that focuses on uh, building a school or improving a water system. But that in itself is only security and peace for their internal operations. What it doesn't address are shared valued opportunities that include economic opportunities for local communities. So we help them work with youth um, that were unemployed and very heavily involved in the coca sector in terms of cultivating as well as trading uh, to be included in their operations. And what this does is it solved a couple problems. One is that this oil company was paying a lot for services, technical services coming in from Bogota and Medellin to work on the pipelines and on administration and logistics um, and didn't invest in in youth populations to build up their skills and include them in their operations at a lower cost. And therefore, extracting youth out of the high risk activities they were doing around COCA and involving them in productive opportunities with incomes um, for their areas. So that's, that's one example of, and I know there's millions out there, but again, it's those tiny examples for private sector and for businesses to be able to take a hold of and run with at a very local level. At, at a macro level, uh, w there's a lot of discussion taking place right now about the role of private sector in peace building and especially towards uh, the SDG 16 and how they can um, include more of their practices to ladder up into, uh, you know, progress along SDGs. You know, ethical um, goods is one area of focus for many companies and I think the challenge is in um, not necessarily creating the ethical good, but the marketing of it and the communication to consumers. I think there's a huge uh, opportunity to take the, a page out of the playbook from the environmental movement that has had tremendous success and, and continuing success in transforming behaviors of consumers to focus on the impact of products on the environment. If we can use that same framework on how companies can um, uh, position themselves with their consumers to focus on the impacts of peace building through their products and services, um, I think we might be able to get somewhere. Um, obviously, in a place like Colombia, there's also government incentives to be able to um, invest in peace. Right now, under the peace plan, uh, there's a, a, a tax arrangement for companies uh, that will invest in, in, in peace building activities linked to the political peace ma machinery. Um, however, that's just a window of time and opportunity. It, we need to look at how you sustainably include businesses in positive peace developments through their behaviors and their investments. Um, and lastly, I want to ensure that the conversation around private sector engagement with peace building isn't just at a multinational level. What we look at in, in Mercy Corps is that the, the private companies work with are really the local companies. These are the traders, these are the monpa stores that sell gum and laundry detergent and cigarettes. They're the small little restaurants or the laundry shops that are the fabric of community. And it's that, it's in those places 
where the real interactions and relationships between people are formed um, that go much beyond a transactional relationship that a multinational may have in, in community A, B, or C. So my message is that when we take the, the great work that um, all of you have done here as well in terms of the metrics and the frameworks, the application of that at a real local level is really important to step by step create those foundations for peace. Thank you.